All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 3rd, 2024. We are coming into some exciting times, aren't we? I know a lot of people are looking forward to five days from now to see what the Lord may have planned. We are all eyes as well. As you know, we're not expecting any pre-trip to take place, but it would not be surprised if an event, something major does take place, and it will be something to wake up the church. The Lord and his mercy preparing his people, I would not be surprised for that. But tonight, that is not our topic. Tonight, we are going to go into some new connections. Oh, yes, you got it. We're going to be adding to it. You guys know uh, when I pray in the shower, this didn't necessarily come when I was in the shower, but, you know, I'm always praying and, and every day, and especially, you know, it, it has been a little bit more difficult, to say the least, over the last uh, two, three weeks. It's It's been heavy. Um, I think a lot of people feel it. I see it in the forum and from people sending me messages, and uh, I feel it as well. And it's kind of, it feels like it's even weighed down on on bringing about teachings, you know, doing this every five days. And, you know, the Lord always comes through, though, because it wasn't until late this morning, early afternoon, that I knew what I was going to teach on. But when I started looking into it, <clears throat> excuse me, I still had no idea. The reason I looked into it, I'll explain as we get a little bit further in. The reason I went into it was just to to see what else we can pull out of these differences in the Gospels. And there are hundreds of things we can we can dig up from there, guys. You know, I know our brother Mike over on Interrupts 165 is either just recently or is about to put out a video <coughs> about uh, another connection that he was looking at. And so I thought, you know, it would be a good idea to to maybe spend some time and go see what I could find in the differences in the Gospels. So. As you guys know, that is that is the foundation to the revelation here in Ministry Revealed. And if any of you ever want to to take some time and see what maybe you guys can find for yourselves, you can go up into this search right here, search, no, study, and you can come. This is on blueletterbible.org. Come up to this study link at the top and click on Harmony of the Gospels. And so I hadn't done this in a long, long time because, you know, I just go through them and I just find as I'm going. But I felt like I needed a little inspiration. And so yesterday, late yesterday, I was going through this and, you know, seeing what might catch my attention. And something caught my attention, which is the fish caught for the tribute and the fact that it's only used in Matthew chapter 17. Well, it never dawned on me that Matthew chapter 17 is something we know very, very well in its timing. It didn't even dawn on me. So I had made a note, you know, left this open, and I thought today, uh, after I get going, get set up, I'll spend some time digging into this. Well, I had a glimpse of an idea where it might go, but I had no idea to the depth and everything it would lead to. The Again, proving out over and over and over and over again that the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and the revelation of the true number of years for the end of days being 14 years in the period above are absolutely true. You're going to see this tonight as we get into it. <clears throat> We're going to start with something that's, that's very strengthening and encouraging. We're going to talk about this group of people of remnant remaining to work and see how it connects to the end based on words and things that are said in Matthew chapter 17 that connects to this. Now, you have to remember, I went in there looking to see something about the fish. And as I went in there to see something about the fish, something else caught my attention and it opened up a whole bunch more. It was wild. So it's always a lot of fun. It's always exciting. And, you know, I tell you, man, if it wasn't for this, I wouldn't have the energy for anything. I, you know, I feel like so many people that are just like feeling beaten up and and just, you know, heavy, right? Well, I'm so glad. I am I'm so honored. We're so blessed 
that the Spirit has opened our understanding in all of these things to to open up his end time books. It truly, truly is a blessing. And, you know, today was some great news as well, because one of our brothers and I apologize, I can't remember his name, <clears throat> but I saw in one of his comments that he had been talking to his mother and sending her videos about ministry revealed. And she kept saying, I think it was him, was saying, you know, that he's in a cult. He's in a cult. He's in a cult. And so he would still send videos. And then finally, I think he had stopped for a bit and he just sent her one just the other day. And she says, oh, is this from that guy? And he didn't answer. He didn't respond to his mom's uh, email. So she ends up watching the video. She watches the video and says, this guy knows what he's talking about. This was really good. And she started going in video. He started, he responded and said she was going now video after video after video going through it all. What a beautiful blessing that is, right? To hear that one of our mothers has come on, has come on board or is diligently seeking out these revelations. The spirit is opened in her. It's absolutely fantastic. Another one today, I was talking to our brother Mark <coughs> and he, uh, he helps with uh, food deliveries for the needy, and he was he met this pastor who he had met and known for years, but had had finally had an opportunity alone to talk to her about some of these revelations, and she instantly he said, she instantly said, that makes so much sense. It's this female pastor. Her name is Dawn, and it instantly made sense to her because she had spent time like everybody else does studying the scriptures and knew there were so many things that that you know these contradictions within the gospels that appeared to be contradictions that couldn't be explained away by simply saying it was perspective because it's completely different and it dawned on her she recognized it and so mark starts telling her a whole bunch of things and uh hopefully now she's spending a little time here checking out some of the videos like that intro series man so that was a a great part of the day this afternoon while I was studying into this so it became a, a great day and I always love hearing those stories of people that suddenly realize and, and start diligently seeking it, it's incredible and here's what I recommend to everybody that's new see this playlist right here on YouTube you come to this playlist right here called the revealed end time study note series and watch the first four videos the other place you can go is you can click on the link right here, ministryrevealed.com. When you do, here's the website that will pop up. You can go into the menu box. You'll often hear me talk about the forum. If you want to join the forum, it's absolutely free. You come down here, it'll take you about five seconds to sign up. There's about 1,200 people worldwide in there and a number of people sharing from prayer requests and Bible studies and things they're, they're looking into and all sorts of things going on in there. But the other place you can come and watch is this intro series right here. By clicking on this intro link, you're going to get the same first four videos in order. Okay, you recognize that picture. This first video is a 22-minute intro of the next three videos. The second video is a 30-minute intro, a 30-minute Bible study, giving you some of the simple differences within the Gospels that have been revealed and what they reveal is the differences in who the synoptic gospels are, sp are speaking to. John stands on his own and the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days, as it says, the last will be first, the first will be last. Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You see only in Jesus, in, in Luke, Jesus is arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, before going to the cross, he's arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. And we always say, what were, the, were these guys colorblind? No. These differences in the Gospels are prophecy. They are absolute prophecy. And it is the bride of Christ that Christ represents with that gorgeous robe, white, radiant, beautiful. That is the representation of the pre-trib bride. Because you're going to find out in this, in Luke, Mark, Matthew, that realizing there are three different groups, it reveals pre, mid, and post all being true. And you're going to see, just, just consider Revelation 17. You have the woman riding the beast who's arrayed in purple and scarlet. And in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. And in Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. 
these are the types of little insights that you're going to begin to understand in this 30 minute intro. The third video is the 14 year revelation. As soon as you start to realize the differences in the Gospels and that Luke, Mark, and Matthew are speaking to different people during the periods of the end of days, you're going to realize that the end of days isn't one seven year period, but two sets of seven years and luke's is a portion called above which is 50 days the pre-trib bride goes above at the start of the 50 days then at the end of 50 days the 14 year start at the seventh year of seals in the seventh year of seals the great multitude mid-trib rapture of mark the world the house of israel that is the uh, the gentiles grafted in with the house of israel that is the group for the great multitude rapture and then post-trib is matthew and that is when the lord returns feet down on the mount of olives to begin the 14th year or the seventh year of trumpets when you understand these differences in the gospels once you begin to see it you will see the discourses open up as you never have before in fact once you get past the fourth video this is a three-hour teaching on the differences in the gospels and then here's one here revealing the discourses in order it will blow your mind you will see these things that have caused confusion caused questions come alive before your eyes and then the fourth video is it's all because of matthew now this one is a big video this one's two hours and 45 minutes but i promise you it's worth every moment of your time this is the one that's going to help answer how all of this was missed and the simple answer is because for hundreds and hundreds of years we have all been taught from the gospel of matthew and the world hadn't realized because it never knew who mark and luke were speaking to they focused on all of their understanding from matthew went a little bit to mark for other perspective went a little bit to luke for other perspective but because their foundation was laid in matthew unbeknownst to them everything they saw prophetically in the epistles and everything going forward they associate it to Matthew's portion of time. So they believe that the great multitude rapture, the, the pre-trib is everybody going pre-trib. Well, that is the end of Mark's gospel. That is a picture of the seventh year of seals in Revelation chapter 7 when the great multitude rapture go before the seven years of trumpet judgments begin for Judah. It's going to blow your mind those are the first four videos and we recommend them to everybody to watch first especially if you're newer so now with that let me get my sip of coffee and let's get into some fun stuff here this was also something that was just shared with me a few days ago and i want to i want you to see this okay what have we revealed about this beginning of the end of days if 2024 is the year, and I do believe it is, I believe we've been able to prove it through counting the Jubilees from the time Christ declared it in uh, Luke chapter 4, knowing the time frame in which that took place, we've been able to reveal in this Shemitah year chart all the way from the time of when Christ made this declaration in about 29 AD that he was declaring the Jubilee in Luke 4 18 through 21 we counted the Shemitah years that followed all the way through to our day and age and showed that the next Jubilee true Jubilees not Israel becoming a nation not not Jerusalem not declaration of this not a none of covenant of this no but from the words Jesus declared in the real in in relation to the words he declared in the jubilee that was in luke chapter 4. we followed that forward and we know and have proven that the final jubilee comes at the end of tribulation a lot of people are trying to declare a jubilee is this year or next year or last year or whatever that might be a jubilee of something but it is not the jubilee and we are looking for the jubilee it is the jubilee that will bring about the beginning of the millennial reign okay it comes after what seven 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 times seven years 
Then you have the final Jubilee. Well, lo and behold, when you go back to the last one from 8990 and you count it forward, that means 2024, which Feast of Trumpets 2024 would begin the final 14 years from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, that when the 14th year is over at Feast of Trumpets, guess what? On the 10th day, the sounding of the shofar for the Jubilee and the restoration of all things. It's absolutely incredible. This is one of the reasons why we show we can understand and have proven that this year, with that understanding and that revelation and everything else going on in the world, that 2024 is the year. Now, we also know that 2024, the 14 years, will begin on the day and hour no one knows, but we also know that 50 days come before it. And we've shown how these 50 days from the 9th of Av to the 29th of Elul, we've shown in many teachings, you can go look it up for yourself, we've shown how it gets there. We've shown how the count begins from Taurus, which is the Hebrew month of Savan. This year it's in June. And how it's two months later from Jesus' birthday. And that would be the time when Jesus returns, right? What do we know? We know that the escape is somewhere around right here, give or take the 12th of August, if it's in 2024. From that time, there is going to be a seven-day wedding. When the seven-day pre-trib wedding is over, the Son of Man is coming to begin his 40 days as Jonah was. He's coming for what? He's coming for 40 days as the white horse rider, son of man, okay? It's a mystery to most people, but we've revealed it here unequivocally over and over again. This is one of those things that when you realize the differences within the Gospels and you realize that Jesus never fulfilled the Jonah 40 days, the one that in Luke, the one in Mark that says no sign is given, and then he left, and then the one in Matthew, which we're going to touch on today, when he says three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, he has not fulfilled that, okay? We've proven it, we've shown it, and it's connected to stuff we're going to talk about today in this, in this new revelation in the differences of the Gospels in Matthew 17 today. So why am I showing you this? <clears throat> Those of you who have been following for a while know what this would equal, okay? We know that this would be the time of the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Well, guess what? When the Son of Man, when the, when the pre-trib bride is taken, who is the pre-trib bride? Judah or the Gentiles, right? Jews or Gentiles? It's his Gentile bride, right? When he returns on the eighth day, who is he going to anoint as his, as his disciples, right? Not the apostles, but the disciples as we've spoken about many times. We know they're going to be Gentile disciples. We've proven it. We've proven it through Luke 15, uh, sorry, through Acts 15. We've proven it in Romans. We've shown it many, many, many places. So its, it's relation is to the time of, quote, unquote, the Gentiles, right? The, the house of Israel for which the Gentiles are grafted in. So what if I told you we know everything has a seven-year cycle first, right? Remember what I was just showing you? <clears throat> The entirety of all the story of history is on the Shemitah 7777, right? Just like the King James Bible, it started in, in 1604 <clears throat> and it completed in 1611. Lo and behold, it ended up on an exact Shemitah cycle. Well, let me show you something else. We know that the end of days is what we call a big picture. The big picture is 21 years, okay? It's seven easy, seven of seals, and seven of trumpets. It's like the picture with that we, we spoke about in, in the last video with Leah and Rachel. The total is 20 years, and when this 20th year, seven, seven, and six, when this 20th year is over, he renews his covenant. He made a covenant with his father-in-law. <clears throat> sorry, sorry. 
after this six then he made he renewed a covenant or made a covenant with his father-in-law and this is the covenant that the lord renews that he had made at the end of seals okay had to break as we've taught at mid trumpets and he will renew in that final year it's the same prophetic picture but these first seven years we all expected that it was going to be the pre-trib happening seven years ago and over the last year and a bit we've understood that it was going to be now connected that what in 2017 the revelation 12 sign that got everybody's attention was the beginning of the 21 year count so not only do we get this jubilee count from christ in luke 4 not only do we see that the king james was was completed in an exact seven year shemitah cycle but we end up this year at the feast of trumpets being exactly one year uh seven years from the beginning when the spirit started waking up the bride this is what was going on now let me let me show you something if i said if we know that it was for example feast of trumpets and I said, well, then it's going to start at Feast of Trumpets. You see what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It would start the beginning of the eighth year. So the last day of the year isn't going to be Feast of Trumpets 2024. It's the 29th of Elul, of course, right? So this would be the end of your seven years, your first seven years. Okay? Well, what else happened in 2017? Remember what I was saying. He is coming for his Gentile bride first. He is coming for his Gentile remnant servers, servants, right? His, his remnant bride that is remaining to work is his, um, his Smyrna group, his Luke 24 workers. This is them when he's returning from the wedding. This would be the last day, right? And what would this be? What would this be an anniversary of, my brothers and sisters? Well, do you remember what happened back on August 21st, 2017, on the one called the Great American Eclipse? You sure do, don't you? The Great American Eclipse happened on August 21st, 2017. August 21st, 2017, exactly seven years later, on the 20th of August, 2024, on a Gregorian Gentile calendar count, we have the exact end of seven years from the Great American Eclipse. And pray tell. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little cheeky. And pray tell. <clears throat> what do we know this is the equivalent of? The Son of Man, who we have been teaching here for years in Luke chapter 11, when he will be, as Jonah was, a sign which is the 40 days of the Son of Man. Did you catch that? We've been showing this for how long now? This timing, we've been waiting now for like a year. We've been waiting. We understand this is the time. It's been a whole year in, in waiting. <clears throat> and we know that this is the beginning. This would be the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Two months later from his birthday, based on Isaiah to Matthew 4. And what is this date? The exact last seven, the la exact last day of the seven years to the great American eclipse, eclipse that everybody called the sign of Jonah. And what is this day? This would be the day that the Son of Man returns from the wedding and begins his 40 days as the white horse rider. How about that? <laughs> thank you for the brother I, I think it might have been jose if it wasn't i apologize uh that was awesome the connection's right there 
Now watch this. How about this one? In 2017, when we go to the Hebrew calendar of the month of Tishri, we had the great Revelation 12 sign, which we knew was a sign because it wasn't the actual event. And it happened on... Now, again, that's because these calendars might be showing the days off a little bit more based on where the sun with the moon actually was. But it happened on the 23rd of September, which is connected to the Feast of Trumpets. Exactly seven years later, on the Hebrew calendar, is what? Well, it wouldn't be the 3rd of Tishri because it has to be the day before, right? Well, look at this. What's the day before? Exactly the day and hour no one knows. Now, you would say, well, why are you going from a Gregorian calendar count of seven years and then you're going to a Hebrew count of seven years? Well, do you guys remember what happens when the 14 years begin on the Feast of Trumpets? It's the attack against Jerusalem that will destroy Jerusalem by the modern-day Ishmael, who is Bashar al-Assad, Syria. Pretty interesting what's building up with Syria now, isn't it? When you just saw what Israel did in Damascus to get Iran, and we know that it's going to start what with Iran? It's going to start with a war against Iran, where Iran, right here, after the pre-trib escape, Iran is going to destroy Haifa and Tel Aviv. There's going to be a short Middle East war, that will last for the week while the wedding is in heaven. And then the Son of Man is here for 40 days. Son of Man is gone. Not many days. Brings you to the true Pentecost from the Feast of Weeks. The anointing of that remnant worker. They go out from Jerusalem. And then what happens on the day and hour no one knows. The beginning of the 14 years and the attack on Jerusalem. The attack on Judah, on the house of Judah. This attack on the house of Judah is connected to what? The Hebrew calendar. It is connected to the day and hour no one knows, which is exactly what? Seven years from the Revelation 12 sign. Hello. Is everybody hearing that? Not only do we have the Revelation 12 sign, seven years, we have the seven years to when we have proven scripturally when the Son of Man will come as Jonah for 40 days. Isn't that crazy? If you weren't too sure... Uh, uh, prior to this video and you were still eh, you might be a little bit more excited now it was awesome so awesome so I'm so grateful when when people send me things you know they they make it specific right I've got to take this time to go and look into these things and when people I'm being sent a bunch of stuff I can't always get to everything quickly so when people send things or they post things or a comment or a private message email whatever it is you know, and they, they say it specifically, and I can take a, a quick look into things. Man, it's so awesome what you guys are finding, too. Absolutely incredible. So now, let me take you into something we haven't, we haven't touched on in, in quite a while. And this is going to, it, it ties into what we were talking about, the whole wedding and the remnant workers. And then it's going to lead us in to the other part that we're going to talk about. This is something we haven't shared in a while. And it was such an awesome, awesome find. Remember this in Luke chapter 9. So Luke chapter 9 is a very, very important pre-trib chapter. And we've shown that down here in relation to the transfiguration. We've even got a video on the transfiguration. And what you find out is when you go to the differences of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you realize... <clears throat> That the difference for saying in Luke about an eight days, in Mark it says after six days, 
in Matthew, it says after six days, what you realize is this right here. You have seven years as a picture of days, but seven years, but not quite to the end. Because remember, before the next seven years starts, there's the 50 days. So what would be not quite the end of seven days? It would be about an eighth day. So you have this prophetic picture of seven, not quite the eighth day. Or as we know, prophetically, you can show days as years in prophecy. That's been known for hundreds of years. What about Mark? Marx, in his transfiguration, says after six days, which is after the six years of seals. What does Matthew say? Marx is in chapter 9. Matthew's is in chapter 17 that we're going to touch on with some new revelation. Matthew chapter 17 says that it's after six days, which is after the six years of trumpets. And what are all of these a picture of? They're a picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man coming in the midst of the 50. They're a picture of the uh, uh, of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of, of seals. And it's the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives after the sixth year of trumpets. That is the prophetic picture of the transfiguration. And you could even see in the wording that comes before it. So it even says, like in Luke 9, 27, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. This is the pre-trib group. Bam. The next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. In Mark 9, 1, before the transfiguration, it says, they shall have seen the kingdom of God come with power. You see? So they're seeing it in a past tense because they're going to see it coming. They're going to see the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the start, at the end of the sixth to the start of the seventh year. But the rapture doesn't happen till the mid of the seventh year of seals. So you have this past tense. Some of you will not taste the death till you shall have, shall have seen the kingdom come with power. And then you go to Matthews and Matthews, it starts in 16, I think verse 28 or 38. And it says that uh, when he's coming with power and glory and it's completely different, and it's about him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is why the, the differences in the Gospels, as you begin to understand these things, are so incredibly powerful. So now let's go back up here and see how this story starts. Because listen to what this said. It said, and it came to pass about in eight days. Now only, do you, you only read this in Luke as well. After these sayings. It came to pass about in eight days after these sayings. So eight days earlier, which is related to the wedding, which is talking about the pre-trib wedding that started eight days earlier, right? Because the Lord is coming not only about the eighth year, like just before the eighth year is about to start, which is the first year of tribulation, but it's also a reference to the eighth day that he's coming on. It's fantastic when you understand it. So let's go back and see what the sayings were before this happened. Watch this. In Luke 9, 14, for they were about 5,000 men, and he said to his disciples, make them sit down by 50s in a company. There's your word for sit down. Look at this word for sit down. It means to recline, to take a place at a table, to make sit down at meat. Now, we know this is only going to be related to Luke's group. I'm going to show you. It's used three times. But do you think maybe one will be in Luke, one will be in Mark, and one will be in Matthew? If that's what you think, you might want to think again. And then look at the company. It's used one time. This company sitting down is at a party meal, and they're reclining at this party meal. And the word for sit down is a group of people that's going to be given to recline at this meal. Okay? Well, now watch this. We go to this meal, and look what happens. Look at where this is used. Three times only in Luke. And 
every single reference is directly related to the pre-trib bride who goes to the invited wedding, who, who's invited to the wedding, and to the remnant workers when he returns from the wedding on the eighth day. Check this out. 914, there it is right there. And look at this, 14.8. What is Luke chapter 14, verse 8? You guys know it well. It's the pre-trib wedding feast. You see, there's a wedding feast in Luke. There's none in Mark. And then there's another wedding in Matthew because there's a pre-trib Gentile bride and there's a post-trib Jewish bride. And we've shared on this before that there are two weddings and we've got videos on it. So listen, you guys remember this one very, very well. We've talked about it many times. Maybe it's a good reminder to bring it up again. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down, there it is, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place. And thou begin with, sh and thou being with, sh begin with shame, to take the lowest room. But thou, when thou art bidden, so when you're called to the wedding, don't go sit in the highest room. So when you get taken in the pre-trip, don't go sit in the highest room when you get to the third heaven. Go sit, it says, in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee comes, he may say unto you, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. Which means, go sit in the lowest room. And we've said this before, you know, in this ministry, everybody who's a part of this ministry that gets taken pre-trib should never, not one of them, should go and sit in one of the highest rooms. They should all, we should all sit in the lowest room. And if it's his will, he will bring those who are to be elevated to the higher rooms. They will be brought forward. We all know this probably better than any other ministry. So not one of us should be caught off guard in our excitement to go into the higher room when the pre-trib happens. This is to the pre-trib wedding invite. And we've showed how the parable of the great banquet is only in Luke chapter 14 because this wedding banquet is about or this great banquet is the meal that the Lord has when he returns from the wedding with the group who are going to be his remnant servers who are going to be part of the resurrection of the just when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is the same as what we've taught on many times the Luke 24 group is that prophetic picture when he returns from the wedding and he's come to begin his 40 days, he's going to take a group to have a meal with them, which of course we have shared a number of times is directly connected to this group right here. This is them, the first watch of Luke 12, 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like men who wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, you may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. The second watch is the 144 at the end of seals. And the third watch are the 12 tribes during the millennial reign. This is the first remnant group. They are that same group. Now, let me prove it to you. Check it out. The other place this is found is in Luke 24, 30. In Luke 24, 30, the direct associated depiction of this first watch, this first remnant group. And where do we see it? Where was it? Was 30. In Luke 24, 30. It says right here, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. You see that? Only Luke's, we've taught on this many times, only Luke's does he sit with this group of people, serve them and eat with them. In the other ones, they already ate. Or it was a completely different story in Matthew. 
It only happens with the Luke one. Why is this so exciting? Why is this exciting that this is here connected to this, which is precisely from Luke chapter 9, the events that are taking place in this before, which is, which is a picture of the wedding, before he comes what? Before he comes about an eight days later, for which he then is going to meet with the Luke 24 group and have that banquet meal with. Check this out. For those of you that, that are newer and have struggled with this and, and can't understand how it's 14 years, this is where it began in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's uh, verse starting in verse 2. It's a prophetic word as well. I knew a man in Christ. So those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, are going pre-trib. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. That's the 50 days before the 14 years. It was a person who was like. Such an one means like. Okay? Like a rapture. That's the word for rapture. Harpazo is the Greek word rapture. To the third heaven. The first group is going to the third heaven. Then it says, I knew such a man. So this is the word like again. So it's not like the ones in Christ, but they, they believe in Christ and it says, this is the one that was caught up. This is the great multitude rapture that goes to paradise. And then when you come down, you see Paul prophetically speaking. Now it's the third time. So you had a taking and a taking. And now it says the third time I am ready to come to you. Now he's coming to them. So a taking, a taking, one to the third heaven, one to paradise. And now he's coming to them. Why is he coming to them? Because this has to do with then the millennial reign. He deals with all the enemies and the millennial reign beginning, which is going to be the, the city, the, the, the rebuilding and everything, and the Lord ruling for a, for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Why is this important? Why am I bringing it up in relation to what we were talking about with those who get to recline? Well, check this out. We haven't shared this in a little bit. This is from the Apocrypha book from Fragment 5. It says, As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven, the third heaven, will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise, and others will possess the splendor of the city. Hello. Can you say 2 Corinthians chapter 12? For everywhere the Savior will be seen according as they will be worthy who see him, but that there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that of those who produce 60 fold and that of those who produce 30 fold for the first will be taken up into the heavens, which is the third heaven. The second class will dwell in paradise and the last will inhabit the city. Hello. Pre, mid, post, 14 years and above. Now listen to this. Uh, let's continue. For all things belong to God, who supplies all with a suitable dwelling place, even as his word says, that a share is given to all by the Father, according as each one is or will be worthy. Now listen to this. And this is the couch in which they will recline who feast. <laughs> in which, this is the couch in which they will recline who feast being invited to the wedding. Hello. Can you say 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is true? That there is a pre, mid, and post? And that there is a group in the pre connected to the wedding who are going to get to recline at the party. Hello. How awesome is that, right? I had to share that one because it's connected to the pre trib and it's connected to those when he returns. So the pre trib connects. So actually, in the first one in Luke 9, the first one in Luke 9 is connected to both, right? Which is the, the Gentile bride about to go and the remnant workers from them. In Luke 14, it's about the bride, those who were invited, going up to the wedding. And in Luke 24, it's the remnant who remained to stay. Just as it said 
those that that it was before these words, right? That before these eight days, and now he's here for the eight days. So he's with them during the seven, and he comes to them on the eighth day, which is the beginning of his 40 days, as Jonah was, and it just so happens it's exactly seven years from the great eclipse. I'm telling you, you should be really excited now. <laughs> All right. Now, let's take this forward. Now, remember, as I was telling you, that I came in looking for this, looking for some inspiration, and I was praying because I just, I didn't, I didn't have anything, right? I'm just, Lord, you know, repetition is key, but, you know, there, I, I need to add some, some new understanding, some new key pieces in Revelation. And so this is the one that really caught my eye. And so this afternoon, late this morning, I thought, okay, it's time to dig in. Let's see what I can find. Well, lo and behold, it didn't take very long because even though I was going to look for the portion of the fish understanding, I came across something else right off the bat. Watch this. Remember, Matthew 17 is the after six days. The after six days of Matthew 17 is the after six years, as I said earlier, of the seven of trumpet judgments. And we know it's the end of the seventh, the end of the sixth year of trumpets, or the end of the thirteenth year to the start of the fourteenth year, the seventh trumpet. So we've understood this for a long time, and we'll cover a little bit of that. But knowing this, at or sorry, even though I knew this, it didn't actually dawn on me when I saw that this said Matthew 17. I just, I saw it and I thought, okay, I, this caught my attention. I'm going to go look. Okay, it's only in Matthew. It's not in the other ones. I'm sure there's going to be something there. It didn't even dawn on me, dawn on me at first that it was Matthew 17 and that it had a prophetic picture to the end. We've never gone into this part before. We've never had a deep conversation in relation to this portion. So it just never dawned on me. And as I started studying, you know, I say it all the time that when it comes to spirit led i i can't explain it to you but as i read i instantly 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 from chapter to verse to chapter to chapter to verse to all of these places just boom 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 they all connect and connect and connect and i'm just like oh my goodness this is going to be a fun one because it, it it's because it's spirit led I've always said it before, I'm a mouthpiece for the Lord. I'm the, the mouthpiece through the Spirit to reveal the revelation. This is what's been happening for six and a half years. So it, it's one of those that when this was happening today, you know, I always thank the Lord, but I was just like, man, thank you, you know, because I was feeling a little bit bummed and down with it. And then just, and I was like, all right, I know what today's video is going to be. I went and had lunch after. I put a little bit of it together, went and had lunch, and I said, okay, I'll come back to deal with the fish part after lunch. And, of course, then the rest of it just continued. It's so incredible. So in the story, as it said here, it goes from verse 24 to 27. So, of course, I started in verse chapter 24. Listen to what it says. And when they came, <clears throat> in Matthew 20, uh, 17, verse 24, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, does not your master pay tribute? That's all it took. <laughs> that was all it took. The rest that's going to come after is gravy, but awesome connections as well. I went and looked at this word tribute. This word tribute is only used two times so i thought well it's only used twice i'm going to go look up the word tribute itself because that one's only used twice but i know there are many other places where the word tribute is used in scripture and of course the one that stood out was deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 10 you guys already know why that's important right well you're also about to see why it's important in what I was sharing with you in relation to the remnant workers, that we know their timing is connected to the Feast 
of weeks. The true feast of weeks. For those that have been around at least for a little bit, you'll remember this, that right before the pre-trib is taken, what we read in, in, in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 36, when he says, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning as you yourselves like men who wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding night, when he comes and knocks, you may open unto him immediately. He's talking to that remnant worker group right here. Right before he takes the pre-trib, he's letting this group know so that they're not going to be in a panic when the pre-trib happens and they find themselves left behind. Yet they were in Christ, spirit-filled, repentant, loving, you know, seeking diligently with the Lord. He's going to let them know ahead of time. This is what's going on. So this is what we're seeing. This is when that's going to happen for them. So when we go to Deuteronomy 16, and we're looking at this connection to tribute, you're going to see this pre-tribute connection of this free will offering from this tribute, but why on earth am I connecting it to Matthew 17 if Matthew 17 is post-trib at the Lord's return? Well, just hold on. You will see. <laughs> okay, so look at what happens. In Deuteronomy 16, starting in verse 9, seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as you begin to put the sickle to the corn we've proven that that is wheat how do we know it's wheat because the feast of weeks is the feast of wheat harvest it is the feast of weeks when they begin to cut the the wheat in ancient times they put the sickle to the wheat and they do that for seven sabbaths and then the the feast of weeks the first fruits of the wheat harvest is brought in that is the pre-trib but what else is brought in listen to what it says and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute. So when the feast of weeks is going to be brought in, what did we just show? We saw in Luke 9, we saw in, in Luke 24 and in Luke 14, the connection to the remnant workers and the pre-trib group, <coughs> excuse me, with those who are going to get to recline, right? Well, from this Feast of Weeks being brought in, listen to what it says. And thou shalt keep the Feast of Weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering. Now, hold on a second. If you go to Leviticus 23 and you see what's offered at the Feast of Weeks, you see that it's the first fruits, right? The ones with leaven, they are the first fruits. Okay, this is the 10 percent, the the 10 percent of the church, though, those 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17 and only the Samaritan, only the one came back and gave thanks and praised the Lord for 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 what he had done. That is the representation of the 10 percent of wheat that goes first, which is the pre trib Luke group. But what did Deuteronomy say? Deuteronomy, <clears throat> excuse me, wasn't saying the free the, the first fruits. He's saying. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God. And when you keep the feast of weeks, what are you, what are you doing? You're bringing in the first fruits. Okay, you're bringing in that first to the Lord. Now listen to what it says. But you're also going to do what? You're going to also offer with a tribute. Okay, there's the word tribute. And look at this one. It's only used one time. So for all of those places where tribute is used so many times, I think, what, 37 times in 35 verses. Here I am in this one, and it's the one only used once. In its abundance, it's liberally. Well, are you ready for this? This tribute is of a free will offering. Are you ready, brothers and sisters? Are you ready for, for Luke chapter 12? Are you ready to be girded about? Many people have said, uh, are we going to get to choose? I mean, I would rather just go to the third heaven. I can't deal. I don't want to be part of tribulation working for the Lord. Well, this is called a tribute of a free 
will offering. Let me prove it to you. Check this out. Okay? Could be spontaneous, freely, voluntarily, willingly. Ready for this? It comes from the Hebrew word 5068. Hence, to volunteer as a soldier. Offer self willingly. Hence, to volunteer as a soldier for the Lord. None of you will be asked to do something or, or said that you have to do it because it is a tribute of a free will offering. Who do you think this is? You got it. It's, it's the Luke 12, those girded about in the first watch. It's the Luke 14, when he returns from the wedding and has a banquet, which is the Luke 24 group, the, one, the ones represented as those on the, the road to Emmaus. This is that free will offering from among them. Pretty awesome, right? Well, why is it awesome? Because right off the bat, this connection, even though what we're talking about here in this part is pre-trib, the connection that came from it is what we're looking at in post-trib. Because this conversation is post-trib. In fact, it's so post-trib, wait until you see what I show you. But why was, it in, why was it interesting that this tribute is connected to one as a free will offering at the beginning, which is related to the remnant workers who will work during seals? Many of you guys probably already know the answer. You should know the answer. But I'm going to clarify as we continue and get closer to the end of it. Listen to what this says now. Look at what the word tribute here means. This word tribute, in all of the places it speaks about tribute, and there's others even in the, in the Greek, in the New Testament, but look at this. This tribute and this tribute is only used twice. Twice. Only two times, and it's, it's in the same verse. Look, here's another tribute right here. This one's different. This one's a tax tribute. So what on earth is this tribute talking about? That they received, that they that received the tribute money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay tribute? This word for tribute, are you ready? Here it is right here, G1323. It comes from the Greek word 1406. The Greek word 1406, check it out, means silver coin. That should ring a bell, right? Don't we know somebody in Scripture where it says he was paid 30 pieces of silver? You see, when you read it in Mark and in Luke, there is no mention just that he was paid money. Only Matthew, as we've taught on many times, tells us that he was paid 30 pieces of silver. So it's interesting how right off the bat, this word for tribute is connected to coin and silver. But not a big deal because it's the word tribute. And it's, it's for money. However, why does this tribute in Matthew 17 only get used twice? <clears throat> well, let's keep following the root word of it. Check this out. It goes to Greek word 1405. The Greek 14 word, 1405 is to grasp, that is figuratively, entrap. Well, that's kind of what happened with Judas did with Jesus, right? Which we know prophetically is a picture of what is going to happen. You guys all know the word again, right? It's going to happen again, which means to, to do twice, right? But this time... In the prophetic end of days, who's going to do it? <clears throat> Who does it in the prophetic end of days? Right? Don't we know who this connects to in the end of days? Right? How about Revelation 11? In Revelation chapter 11, at mid-trumpets, 
when it says, when the pit is open, right? So it says in Revelation eleven seven, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. We've shown who the two witnesses are. He makes war against them. We know that this war by the beast who is there with the dragon, right? Who's there with the dragon? Because now you've got the beast who is the antichrist, right? The, the beast who is the one out of the sea. You've got the beast out of the earth who is the false prophet. And you've got the dragon who is Satan. And it is Satan who gives the beast the power when Satan is cast down at mid-trumpets, as Revelation 12 talks about, and the bottomless pit is open, and there's a two-and-a-half-year war against the two witnesses before they're killed, and it's three days and a half before they stand up, and at that hour, an earthquake, and it's the end of the 13th year of tribulation, or the end of of the six days or six years of trumpets of Matthew 17. Hmm. So, the beast, and we know that the dragon gave him his power and his authority, right? The dragon is part of this deal too. Well, look what happens. It goes to the root word of Greek 1404. Are you ready? The serpent. The dragon. Precisely the ones going after and killing Christ for the tribute of money, which are the 30 pieces of silver. Pretty crazy, right? Well, it gets better. Because if you go continuing to look at this word, you're not sure that, that, that it's true. You just saw the, the, the line of, of revelation from 30 pieces of silver to being tra entrapped to then it being connected with the dragon? Well, how about we go to the other root word? The one from this one right here, the Greek 1364. Are you ready? Want to know what it means? Again, twice. Hello. Hello. How much more clear does that have to be? How many times have we been able to show that out here? Over and over and over again. Well, let's keep going. Because what do we know has a connection within this period of time? Okay? Let's go back up. Let's start in Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days... So again, as I said, we know this is connected to the end of the sixth year of trumpets. All we have to do in this revelation <clears throat> is go to Revelation chapter 11 that we just saw. We know that when the pit is open, the beast comes back and makes war against the two witnesses and kills them. We've proven that this war lasts for two and a half years. We know it's a two and a half year war from Daniel chapter 12. Then the two witnesses are killed. Then it's three days and three nights and a half or three days and a half, which is three days, three nights and the daytime of the next one, right? The morning of the next. They stand on their feet and they go up. And then the same hour, there's a great earthquake. And the second woe, which is the sixth trumpet is over. And then what happens? Boom! This is the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is Zechariah chapter 14 and 11, 15, in Revelation 11, 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. You see, when you go back to Revelation 10, you get the story of this. In verse 7, it says, But in the last days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So as soon as the seventh angel 
begins to sound that last that final trumpet the mystery of god should be finished because now the lord has returned feet down on the mount of olives to start the 14th year after six days after six years is matthew chapter 17 the lord <clears throat> coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. We've broken down much of this before, but if you'll remember, check this out. In Matthew 17, verse 9, And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Okay? This word, this, this phrase, risen again from the dead, we showed in a previous video, it is only used twice in all of Scripture. It is used in Matthew 17, verse 9, and in John chapter 20. And John chapter 20 is a prophetic picture of the very end of the 20th year big picture with the seven easy, then the seven of seals, seven of trumpets. It's the same as right here, that end of the 13th to the start of the 14th year just as matthew 17 9 which is connected to the beginning of that 14th year okay after six days and look at what it says rise again from the dead now let me show you something again this is something i haven't spoken on in a long time long long time but the word Rise again from the dead. <clears throat> the word dead is used a number of times because it means corpse, it means dead, and so forth. Okay? Well, if we can show and we know that he is one of the two witnesses because it's Zerubbabel and Joshua who is Yeshua and Zerubbabel who's rebuilding the temple, Joshua, Yeshua, Messiah, is the high priest and coming at the end who's coming at the end of seals he is the high priest and king melchizedek and and uh, um zerubbabel whoever the modern day zerubbabel is is going to be the one rebuilding in in charge of rebuilding the third temple for which during seals only the foundation was laid listen to what it says <coughs> in revelation 11 4. these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the lord god of the earth well, what happens when we go to Zechariah chapter 4? The candlestick, right? The two olive trees, okay, which pour out into the bowl. And who is it? It's Zerubbabel. And we find out that it's also Joshua. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Verse 7. Zechariah 4, verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Why, O great mountain? Because heavenly Mount Zion is coming. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt be a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall finish it. Okay? Uh, they'll have the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With, whose, with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the, all, through the whole earth, then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And answered said again, and said unto him, What are these two olive branches? And they're called what? His two anointed ones. We go to chapter 6 of Zechariah, and we see them. Zechariah 6 verse 11, Take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, who is a prophetic picture of Yeshua, Jesus, uh, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's building the temple? Zerubbabel, it said. So you've got Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who is going to rebuild the temple. And what does it say? It's going to be the council of peace is going to be between 
them both. This is something we've taught on many times. So in Zach, in Revelation 11, when we see that this war breaks out against the two witnesses and that they're going to be lying in the streets for three days and a half or three days and three nights and resurrect on the third day, this is the end within an hour. It's the end of the 13th year of tribulation, the end of the sixth day. And the Lord at the start of the seventh is going to be seen coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, which is precisely what we were talking about and have shared on a number of times in Matthew 17. So now watch this in relation to rise again from the dead. Okay? The word dead is used 132 times in the New Testament. Now, what you're going to find is that there are so many mysteries there are so many clues so many little little tidbits of of hidden revelation i believe and i've proven in the past that this is also one of them so this rising again from the dead we know it happens at the end of the 13th to the start of the 14th year of tribulation <clears throat> we have proven it throughout many 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 scriptures we know who it is and in relation to this dead, it's used 132 times. Well, we have what's called, in this here, this is called chapters to years. Hosea and Zechariah. This is to the Gentiles, to the house of Israel, the sleeping church, right? Or the Gentiles, the world grafted into the house of Israel. And this is Zechariah to the Jews. Both of them only have 14 chapters in all of the Bible. And one is written to Judah, one is written to the Gentiles. Go figure, right? 14 years of tribulation, and you get insight all the way through of prophetic revelation. Well, what happens when you come to John? 21 chapters, the exact same thing playing out in John's gospel. That's why it happened at the in John 20 as a prophetic picture of the end of it. Right here in, in Zechariah 14, at the beginning of it. So the end of one, the start of the other, right on this line, the Lord returning feet down. <clears throat> excuse me, having having resurrected and then returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. We're not going into the teaching of why he has to die again. We've got many teachings on why he has to do it again, right? The twice again. And he's doing it because of the priestly line, which relates to the bull. So we've taught on these things before. Now, when we go into this, we see 132 times. Well, as soon as I saw 132, it reminded me of what we revealed in the Psalms. From Psalms 18 to 33, from Psalms 118 to 133. And it reminded me of, wait a second, Psalms 132 is the exact same time as Matthew chapter 17 after six years of trumpets. It's the exact same time for that word rise again from the dead and 132. It's the exact same story, the exact same time frame in our chapters to years revelation. So what do you think I did? <clears throat> of course, I went to go look up Psalms 132 and see if I was crazy or if there was really this connection in it. Well, you ready for this? Psalms 132, starting in verse 1, a song of degrees. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. So remember, he has afflictions and he vowed to the Lord. Okay, I want you to remember that. Then we can come down here. We'll see a couple other things. Here's another thing right here. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children also shall sit upon my throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell for I have desired it. Hello. You see how perfectly that lines up? 
when you realize it's him having returned feet down on the Mount of Olives? He has chosen it. It is his place. This is where he has desired it. And this is where it's going to be. We'll get back to this in a moment. Now look what happens up here. David and all of his afflictions, and he made a vow to the Lord. Okay? Soon as I read this, remember I was telling you that these, these connections, and I, I'm instantly reminded of other passages of Scripture just instantly pop into my mind. Huh. What is this period of time relating to? What is it from this line between 131 and 132? What is it here, this end of the 13th to the start of the 14th year of tribulation? What is that period? It's the death and resurrection of the Lord, right? It's, it's what Revelation, we just covered in Revelation chapter 11, being one of the two witnesses, how he is dead for three days and three nights, or three days and a half, and why is it a half? Because Jonah, as you know, in Matthew, right? Let's go to it. In Matthew chapter 12, we see the difference of Jonah's story compared to Luke and Mark's. So we talked about Mark's earlier, which is, I mean Luke's earlier, which is the 40 days of the Son of Man which is connected to the pre. Then in Mark, they're not given any sign. In fact, for those that might be new, let me show you it in Mark and why it's so important. They demand of a sign. And he says, there shall no sign be given to this generation. And he left. This is a big one that a lot of people point to with the contradiction. You had a sign of Jonah in Luke. As 40 days, you had no sign, he tells them here in Mark. And then in Matthew, you have the sign of three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, obviously, you can't say it's perspective. Because here, he said they don't get a sign at all. Remember what I said earlier about not getting a sign? And when you go to Mark's transfiguration story, you go to verse 1, and it says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there... Uh, be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, because this is the great multitude rapture time, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Past tense. They will have seen it come. Because at the end of seals, remember, I just showed you, they were told they would get no sign. That's why when you look at the end of the sixth seal, everybody's freaking out and hiding in the caves and in the rocks and falling on us. They're seeing heavenly Mount Zion coming to the place where the great multitude, those that haven't yet tasted of death, are going to be taken in the great mid-trib rapture. But they don't know when they're going. They're not going when they see him coming. He's coming at the end of six years on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets. So they will have seen it, but they don't get to go until Passover the following year, either first or maybe even second Passover, of that year which is about the middle give or take of the year when he comes the seventh year this is the reason for that and it's completely in alignment why in Ma in mark chapter 8 they were given no sign now we go to matthews matthew 16 at the end of it there it is 28 it says verily verily i say unto you there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they sh uh, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Post-trib. This is when they're going to see him coming. When are they going to see him coming? At the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of 13th year. After what? After he had been killed as Jonah was. You see? As Jonah was in Matthew chapter 12. Because here as the sign of Jonah. It says for jo as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. A whale is what? A huge fish. A fish. 
We didn't get that story <clears throat> about a fish in Luke. We didn't get the story of the, the whale, the fish in Mark. But we get the story of the whale, this big fish in Matthew. Which means, as we've shown, we know that the story of Jonah was prophecy. Hence the differences in all three not having actually been fulfilled. But because the whole world learns from the Gospel of Matthew, they believe these three days and three nights were what Jesus fulfilled at his death and resurrection the first time. But it's impossible, as we've shown unto you before, because in 14 or 15 places in Scripture, we were told that he rose on the third day. The count in Luke 24, 17 says that the angel said, saying the Son of Man must be one, delivered into the hands of sinful men, comma, and means plus, be crucified, comma, plus, the third day, rise again. All of these things together equal him rising the third day, which means the whole thing was only about two and a half days. We spoke about it recently. We know prophetically it's the two and a half years of a battle that takes place against the two witnesses, which he is one of. And he was only actually in the grave for about a day and a half. Many Christians, like pastors, will go to Jews and Jew they'll say, well, Jews tell us that any portion of one day is, is a whole day. So they'll say the, the portion of of the the 14th and then all of the 15th and then the portion of the 16th well that's three whole days it's impossible do you realize why it's impossible <clears throat> because in matthew chapter 17 it says what or, or sorry in matthew 12 in relation to doing it in relation to jonah and fulfilling jonah's prophecy it said that he was three days and three nights. He was a full 24, 24, 24 hours in the great fish's belly. He has not fulfilled this yet. <clears throat> Just like the 40 days of Jonah. He has not yet fulfilled it because after his resurrection, and being here, the world will tell us he was only here for 40 days. And during those 40 days, did he go warning the nation as he did, as Jonah did? Nope. Nope. But when he's here for 40 days, which is Luke's discourse, what does he do for those 40 days? Exactly what he said he would do as Jonah did. Warning Jerusalem that they're about to be encompassed by armies. When they see this, they're to depart and flee because this is the begin beginning of vengeance. He's warning as Jonah did for 40 days. So we've taught on this. We know that it hasn't yet been fulfilled. And we saw here that this dead uh, rising again from the dead is used 132 times. <clears throat> And when we go to see where 132 relates to in Psalms, in our chapters to years revelation that we've had for years, we see that the connection says that he has these afflictions and that he made a vow to the Father. Okay? What happens if we go read this connected time frame to Jonah? which is the representation going on in Matthew chapter 17 when he rises again from the dead after three days and three nights, which is on the fourth day. Let's see what happens if we go to Jonah and track the story. Now, remember, Jonah, the story of Jonah in the, in the prophetic is in reverse because in the prophetic chapter 3, in chapter 4, 
is related to his 40 days. That's the portion for Luke. But in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, it's about his three days and three nights. So let's go have a read and see what we find in connection to Jonah in chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Okay? He's compassed about because he's in hell. Now listen to what it says in Jonah 2, 9, ver verse 9 and 10. But I will sacrifice unto thee. Who is Christ being a typology of? Or who is Jonah a typology of? Christ. He's going to fulfill his 40 days in the Luke portion pre, and he's going to fulfill the three days and three nights resurrecting on the fourth day is the other fulfillment yet to happen by Jonah, who is Christ fulfilling it as Jonah. And what does he say? But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Listen to this. Listen carefully. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord and the Lord spake un uh, and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land what was 132 connected to Christ's death <clears throat> right and him coming again from the dead as the afflictions like David had and how David also gave a vow. He vowed to God. What did he, Jonah say he would do, which was what Christ will do? But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. He's going to pay what he has vowed. Funny how that happened, where these are both lined up from 132 in Psalms and in Jonah connected to the three days and three nights in the mouth of the fish for which Christ comes out of and returns feet down in Matthew 17. Remember, the story is also connected to a fish. Okay, what did he say would do? that he would pay this vow that he said, right? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 17. What did it say? Just again in verse 24. And when they came, they uh, and when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute, which is the silver money entrapment, and this entrapment is connected to the beast and to Satan, they came unto Peter and said, Does not your master, listen to this, pay tribute? Did not your master say he would pay that that he had vowed? Hello? And when he pays it, what is it? It's because he's got to do it again. And what he's doing it for is the 30 pieces of silver, as we know. And when this happens, when he's dead, he's going to fulfill the Jonah vow that he said he would fulfill because salvation begins uh, uh, belongs to the Father. And when he pays it, it was for what? It was by Jonah. It was by, Joan, uh, uh, it was by um, uh, um, Judas. But it was what? The 30 pieces of silver, right? Just like we see in Zechariah chapter 11, which is mid-trumpets. We've talked about it many times. It's I've never gone into this story so detailed before to see this absolute connection to him doing it again because of the money, because of the vow that he said he would pay, which is connected to him as Jonah, 
who would be three days and three nights, which means resurrected on the fourth day, having paid the tribute, which was the entrapment from this Judas typology in the end of days, which is through the dragon and the beast. And who is the beast? I want you guys to remember that. Who's the beast? The beast is Revelation chapter 13. The first beast, right? The, the beast of Revelation 13. Remember, there's two of them. The beast that rises up out of the sea. And the other one, as we have taught, is the one that comes up out of the earth, which is the false prophet. Which, too, we read about, I think, in 2nd Ezra or 2nd Baruch, that the Lord created on the fifth day. We know it's all connected to the time of seals. Okay? <clears throat> well, let's keep going with this story in Matthew 17, realizing all of this prophetic revelation to the end, to that final end of the 13th to that start of the 14th year and don't forget i told you it's still not only is it connected to all this stuff with jonah and being chapter 132 and the connected to the final year revealing and proving out more chapters to years in the story of jonah and its portion in matthew but i showed you in the beginning this connection to to the the remnant workers as well and i did that for a reason because you're going to see it just in these few chapters and in these few verses. So now it says, Matthew 17, 25. So this is Jesus now. And he said, so actually Peter is responding and saying, he saith, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus prevented him saying, what are you thinking, Simon? Right? This is what he's saying. Whoa, whoa, Simon. What were you thinking? Of whom, listen to this. Do the kings of the earth, okay, of whom do the kings of the earth <clears throat> take custom or tribute? You see, it's a different tribute. <clears throat> of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free what 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 are, you, what are you talking about what on earth does this tribute and this tribute that your master said he would pay does he not pay this tribute and then jesus tells simon hey, hey the kings of this earth they take it from strangers you know not not from children and then he says, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, they're, they're, that's right, from strangers. Then Jesus says, then are the children free. Do you recall? Of course you do. Where are we? Where are we in time? Where are we in the prophetic time? We're in the final year of trumpet judgments. We're in the 14th year of tribulation in the prophetic. Who are the children that are now going to be free? It's not talking about the Jews. Because if you recall, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when he returns the third time, he says, I am ready to come to you and I will not be burdensome to you for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not lay up for the parents. But the parents for the children. Judah represents the parents because they've been taught for centuries and centuries and centuries. They know the scriptures. They're, they should be better at understanding, even though we know they err, of course, as scripture tells us. They have erred by their teachers. But they're the parents. They're the ones who, who have been his throughout this whole time. We are in, as we've shown in the big picture of all of creation, we are living in their portion of time, which is the flesh. <coughs> so who are the children then that are free? Well, watch this. Follow the storyline 
and we come to I want to keep it in order we come to the resurrection of Jesus Christ why is the resurrection so important to understand as well because when you understand the differences in Luke Mark and Matthew we have a video it might be in that playlist I'm sure it is actually that not only is the transfiguration showing the coming of the Son of Man for 40 days, the end of seals, and the end of trumpets, but so is the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and so too is the, um, the uh, uh, um, triumphal entry. All three of them are a picture of his pre-, mid-, and post-comings. So when you come to Matthew and you read what we're about to read, you will understand why it's there. <clears throat> Watch this. Oh, is it 27? In Matthew chapter 27. Actually, you know what? While I'm in chapter 28, let me show you this connection. You see what he had said? A little side note one for you. Going back to Psalms 132. Remember I said this? I, I would come back and, and check on this. Watch this. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, <clears throat> then their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. Teaching them and sitting on the throne. Okay? Watch what happens when you go to Matthew chapter 28. Remember, in the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, the one of Matthew is another prophetic type of him coming post-trip. We saw in Luke chapter 12 that there was the first watch was the Luke group remnant bride. The, the, the end of Mark's gospel is the second watch group, which is the 144,000 at the end of seals. And then Matthew, the end of Matthew, is the third watch group, and this is the group that when the Lord is returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives, this relates to the 12 tribes who will go out and now teach the world the ways of the Lord because there is no longer any need for preaching. That's why in Matthew's gospel, at the end, it has no more preaching, but only to what? Teach all nations. You see, verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We've been teaching you that this is the end, the 14th year of him when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And in 132, we're getting all of the exact same wording, which is connected to the, the vowing that he made in his tribulation, this vow that he made that he would fulfill as Jonah did. And here he is after that resurrection, commanding them going out to teach all things, just as it said in 132. And then look what he says. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. What did 132 say? That this will now be my place forever, which is till the end of this world is over, which is the end of the millennial reign. See, we've shown it here. Look at verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So, yes, in a spiritual sense, Christ did accomplish that. But in a literal sense, in, in the actual physical taking place of this, it doesn't happen till the seventh trumpet, which is the start of the seventh year, when everybody will have seen him coming, feet down on the Mount of Olives, as lightning from one end unto the other, which is directly related to Matthew 28 and what he said, great voice in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. Funny how, how all that lines up from Matthew 28 to, to the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11:15, to Psalms 132, to, to Jonah in relation to the three days after three days and three nights. Over and over and over and over and over. The connections are so astronomical, so abundant, 
that it, it these things have become so clear. We can I could rehearse them in my in my sleep. I could teach them because they have gotten so crystal clear. So then the children, if they are the parents, who are the children that then should be free at this time? Of the Lord having returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. Who would be these children? Well, you guys know exactly who they are. <clears throat> we go to Revelation chapter 2. And we see that the Smyrna group, which we've revealed in the seven churches, we've revealed the seven churches and how it plays out in the end of days. Again, I think we're the only ministry that has had it because you have to understand the Gospels and the 14 years. And what do we know about those who some of them will die? These are the remnant workers. These are the ones who put their necks on the line. These were the first watch from Luke 12. And what does it say in Revelation 2, 11? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcome shall not be hurt of the second death. These are the remnant workers putting their necks on the line. So when we get to Revelation chapter 20, and we read about Satan, uh, about the, the Lord having defeated Satan, Satan is now bound for a thousand years, and the millennial reign that is about to, is now beginning, it says the souls of them that were beheaded, not having taken the mark, right, and so forth, it said, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. These are the Smyrna remnant workers we've taught on this many times. This is why when I was showing you in, in Luke chapter 14, you had the wedding first. Those that got to recline, and then you had the remnant workers for which he has a banquet when he returns on the eighth day, which he's going to open to them their understanding for the time of tribulation. He said that it was those who would be part of the resurrection of the just. <clears throat> this is them. And they won't have any, uh, um, on such, the second death has no power. So for the millennial reign, what are they going to be? But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them for a thousand years. You see, because they're the priests. They're that priestly line with them that work during seals. We know that it's that the Gentile ones, as we spoke about in the beginning. These are the ones. Because remember where he is. Where are we in the prophetic understanding of the end? We're at the end when he's returned feet down. He's saying what? Peter said unto him, of strangers. Jesus said unto him, then are the children free. This is them. This is them being free. Listen to what comes next. <laughs> this gets pretty wild. <clears throat> Let me just see up here. Da, 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 da. Okay, now th this part gets really wild. So watch what happens. Matthew 17, 27 as this storyline closes out, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea. Remember, I came into this looking for the thing with fish and all of this other stuff opened. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend, go thou to the sea. Now, wait a second. Offend who? Who should we offend? Right? The kings of the earth. Lest we should offend the kings of the earth, right? The ones who this tribute that they take tribute from. What's the, what thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom and tribute? What does this relate to the kings of the earth? Aren't the kings of the earth part of the, the, the beast system? Part of, of, of Babylon, the great city? They're the kings of the earth. So listen to what it says. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, 
and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. Wait a second. <laughs> catch that when you go in, into the sea and throw in that hook and you catch a fish, that first fish that comes. You're going to open his mouth and thou shalt find a piece of money. Take it to them and give it to them, right? For me and for thee. Who is this first fish? Remember what I said. The fish is only mentioned, this tribute of the fish is only mentioned in Matthew 17. And this entire story of Matthew 17 is precisely directly related to the end of the 13 years of tribulation, to the 14th year of the Lord when he has returned feet down. And the fish has a connection which is to his resurrection when he was as Jonah was, who was spit out of that fish from his afflictions because he had paid what he had vowed and he was spit out of that fish. It's precisely connected to Matthew 17, the entire storyline. It's only in Matthew. Now, who do you think <clears throat> this fish could possibly relate to? If you guys remember, when we were in the Apocryphas, somebody had made a comment the other day. I think they were reading through the Apocryphas as well. And I may have read through it, but I, it never dawned on me what it was. And as I was going through this today and explaining it to my wife, she said the exact same thing all of us say when we read it. Eee. Well, check it out. It is the kings of the earth that this tribute has to be given to. And he's going to catch a fish, which is in relation to this, this fish, which is what? A beast from the sea? Like the beast from the sea, like the whale, when Christ was in hell, when he's going to be there for three days and three nights and a half, right, and resurrect on the, on the fourth day, which is during the day portion. We know that he's not doing it for sins. For anybody who's heard, who hasn't heard this before, Jesus isn't going to die again for the sins of the world. He has already done that. It's because he hasn't yet fulfilled the sins for the priestly line from Aaron is what you read in Leviticus chapter 1. You see that there's a bull, then you see a lamb, then you see the turtle doves. You go in reverse, it's the turtle doves of his birth. It was him being the sacrificial lamb for all of Israel, for all the world. And then he is still needing to fulfill the sacrifice of the ox, of the bull, for the priestly line. That is why this is going to happen. And here we see this relation to fish which was connected to Jonah, for which Jesus, the typology from Jonah, was swallowed into the fish, being in hell for three days and three nights, before resurrecting, before being spit out. And we know that the beast is the fish from the sea. So now watch what happens. For those of you who have read this before, you must have thought, oh my goodness, that's so disgusting. Like me and my wife had thought, until I explained it today, listen to what happens. Because again, remember, who is it going to be for? The kings of the earth. The kings of the earth. So this is post-trib. This is for the kings of the earth. <clears throat> because if you recall also, when he does this again, when, when this relation is to Satan, when you dig into it, and I'm working still, I'm, I'm digging a lot into the, the revelation of, of um, Mystery Babylon, right? Babylon the Great and so forth. I'm digging, digging, digging. It is, it is absolutely connected to Saudi Arabia, okay? And it talks about them that dwell in the desert, okay? So we know the, these nations, we know this, this connection to dwelling in the desert, 
It even says in a couple places, Saudi Arabia, that they won't be pitching tents and so forth. Well, I want you to see this. Because when you come to 2 Esdras, in uh, verse, let's go verse 52 in chapter 6, it says, but to Leviathan, okay? Bohemoth is the false prophet. Leviathan is the Antichrist, is the, the, the first beast from the sea. It says, but to Leviathan, thou didst give the seventh part, the watery part, and thou hast kept them to be eaten by whom thou will and when thou wilt. Remember, they're being, they're being reserved for the time of the end. Remember this when we shared this with the two great monsters, Bohemoth, and they're being kept to the time of the end. And then it says, and they will be nourishment to all who remain. It's like, what? I mean, if, if we're being resurrected in the first resurrection for those who were remnant workers who were volunteered to be soldiers of the Lord, uh, we don't want to be eating. We don't want to be eating them. Well, watch this. Turns out that we find this in Scripture. In Psalms chapter 74. In Psalms chapter 74, look at this in verse 2. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. Remember those workers? And then it says, watch this. In da -da 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 -da, it even talks about uh, uh, in relation to the priestly line. Now listen to this. 74, starting in verse 13. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave it him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Who are the ones who will inhabit the wilderness, the desert dwellers. Who are the ones that are dwelling in this desert dwell dwelling barren land when it's all over? It's in Saudi Arabia. It's going to be given to eat to all the heads of nations in this destruction and everything that takes place. That's what they're going to get. Isn't that crazy? All of this digging through from Matthew chapter 17. This incredible revealed storyline that even though we have understood so much of it, <clears throat> excuse me, from the rest of Matthew 17, and we have understood all of these types and these events over the years, it's so incredible when so many more parts and pieces get added to the picture because every single time i have said this probably a hundred times because every single time it happens it reveals to us the exact same prophetic time frame of the entirety of the story that is being discussed where we have revealed it already being discussed every single time this is why a program like this called esort where you can have the strong's concordance at your fingertips to understand these things that if you read tribute of money you could think that that tribute it was the same as this tribute you could think it's the same as every other tribute that came before it it is when you have something like the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips, like this program called eSword. I am not affiliated with it. I think it's a, a few bucks a year, maybe free, depending on your device. When you dig into these things, and you dig into these root words, you will find mysteries like this. Why, out of all the places the word tribute can be used, it's to relate to the pieces of silver for which the dragon has purchased or has has grasped not purchased but grasped 
has deceived and and deceived Judas to allow Christ to be taken this this future prophetic type of Judas so that he could pay what he had vowed as he said he would as Jonah did which is why that is also found only in Matthew for the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth are you seeing it is absolutely true and it's so connected that it literally tells you it means again twice it blows me away every single time I know that it's hard to accept if you're newer and somebody says my goodness he's talking about Christ dying again there's no way well I would I, I would love it to be no way and it's devastating to hear that he's gonna do it again but when you understand why it all makes sense the answer was hidden in something that the world of church could never fully grasp before and it comes from Hebrews chapter 6 starting in verse 4 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost who on earth is this All right and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come is this every Christian definitely not they haven't all been tasted of heavenly gifts and and powers of the world to come this is a specific portion relating to a group of people who are his priestly remnant workers in relation to the end of days as well as those since Christ's death and resurrection so what does it say about them it says if they so if if one of these people or if a group of these people that have tasted of these things that have received of these powers shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they crucify to themselves the son of god afresh to re-crucify having re-killed him and put him to an open shame it says right here what would happen to a group or a single person that falls away who has partaken in these things and the reason that this group in the end of days cannot be left behind or <clears throat> or fall away forever in this deception in this in this thing that they're going to do losing it against Christ the reason they can't be left is because they have tasted of these tasted of these heavenly things they have the father's name written in their foreheads it is written in or on their foreheads they belong to the father and when you understand this purposed reason this purposed revelation being that it goes all the way back to numbers chapter 20 when Moses and Aaron struck the rock twice Moses struck it twice one represented the rock being struck twice for Israel which is was all of Israel back then and represented the Gentiles grafted in with them in the future and then Aaron was the representation of that other strike that is the priestly line and it is that priestly line of the the pre-workers the trumpets workers and the end of days workers and those that fall that cause this relate to a time during the period of trumpets and it is those 144,000 something within them or or a group that's still with them that falls as a Judas and causes this again to happen but that again is 
for the priestly line who have not yet had their sacrifice, which is why this will happen again. It's brutal. It's hard to, to take in, if you're especially if you're new. But when you understand, as I said earlier, when you read things like this, rise again from the dead, and you realize that it's talking about re-crucifying and that he would do this again twice, it all starts to make much more sense. Wild, wild, wild stuff, guys. So if you're newer and you don't have a program like eSword, get one. I think there's my sword. This one is eSword. I love it. You can download all sorts of different Bible versions. I always use KJV, and the KJV Plus is how you get all of the, the definitions with it, which will multiply your understanding 10 times, 100 times if you use it and dig into word meanings so that these things will explode off the page for you. Because, brothers and sisters, this is the season and time that is at hand, which I believe we are looking to 2024 around August 12th. And there will be, I believe, amongst many of us here in this ministry who have been preparing for six and a half years in the Revelation, a group who will voluntarily, liberally be the free will offering of the volunteer soldiers for the Lord, who when the Lord will then return from the wedding and begin his 40 days, will have the banquet meal and sit with them and serve them and eat together, for which he will then open unto them the scriptures, as we have read many times here down in Luke 24, 44, as I bring it to an end, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Do we know that all things have been fulfilled yet? We know that all things concerning him have not yet been fulfilled in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. I just showed them to you. Hello. Which means this is also a prophetic revelation to the group when he returns and has a meal with them that he will open their understanding in all of these things, which are the things we've been revealing with the New Testament for the past six and a half years. When the Lord comes, he will complete the revelation in our understanding, just as it says here in verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. This is when the Lord will fulfill these things that we've been growing in understanding, growing in preparation for, that when he comes and returns from the wedding, has the meal with this group, he will complete the story of these revelations so that they may know and understand going forward. And at the anointing of the Holy Ghost, at the end of the 50 days, on October 2nd, 2024, as they're waiting wherever this might be in Jerusalem, when they receive that anointing of the Holy Ghost, it will be an outpouring of what we call Acts 2.0. And the abundance of power and revelation and healing that this group of remnant workers will be given will be far beyond the original prophets, the original uh, apostles, the original disciples. Limbs will grow back on people right in front of people's faces. That's how powerful it will be. And it won't be occasionally. Because this will be the time of the greatest revival in human history as World War III breaks out beginning with the battle that destroys Jerusalem at the day and hour no one knows feast of trumpets to start the 14 years. And it'll last of a world war for about two and a half years 
before the beast and false prophet come on the scene and try to settle things down. And then everyone flees in the Mark discourse into the mountains to avoid the Mark of the Beast. In those first two and a half years, it will be the time of the greatest revival in all of human history. And the apostles that will be chosen, there will be some prophets and these remnant disciple workers receiving that anointing here of the Holy Ghost will be part of those bringing in the greatest multitude, the greatest revival of over a billion, 1.2, I believe, billion and change people, some of which will die, of which the majority will still live to the time of the great multitude rapture. It will be a time like nothing else in all of human history. And I believe we are just over what? From from the pre-trib right here, we are one, two, three, about four months. This is not the John four months, right? The John four months begins from the count of the seven Sabbaths when the wheat begins, the, the sickle is put to the corn, which is to the wheat right here, which is four months before it's put to the spring wheat right here. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray it strengthens you. I pray it helps you with, with more understanding, with deeper revelation. Watch it again. Spend time with it. Be, rejoice in the fact that the time is at hand and that both the eclipse of 2017 and the Revelation 12 sign of 2017, both in a Gentile and Hebrew calendar count, equal seven years to both of their time frames. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.